Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to our um, COVID-19 conference, Consequences in Law and Society, it's called. I'm quite, quite sure that everybody experienced what's happening in the society and, and, and around him. Me sitting back home, it's um, my official office time and I'm sitting in a small room back home. I'm happy to have it. Many people even don't have such a room. So um, the standard of living and the quality of life has changed a lot, at least this one. And um, so far, I'm happy to say that I've, I've not been touched by the disease itself, other than I got my first shot with AstraZeneca and got sick for a day. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, if that is, but if that is all, I'm totally happy. <laughs> um, I earn much more. I have much more money in my pocket than before. <laughs> this is one of the positive effects of this this un, unusual situation. On the other hand, yes, I I would normally sit together with you in a room, <laughs> and uh, would be absolutely delighted to see you in person. S but uh, nowadays, I just have to be confronted and see you in form of a screen. Well, that's happening to everybody of us. And um, as you know, this is our half yearly conference, which would normally have taken place in, uh, in, in Germany. And um, I'm hopeful, at least I'm optimistic Optimism will kill me at some point in time, but I'm absolutely optimistic that um, the autumn conference will be held in Australia. And um, as I will be uh, vaccinated, I'm hopeful that I can come. Wait and see. But um, we all see that the different countries react differently to the situation. And um, it's also true as to Germany and Australia, for instance, which will be the major topic of, of today. But before I continue, I hand over to Juliane to give us a, f a few hints as to the technic technical aspects. Juliane? Thank you very much. I would just like to, yeah. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me all. Um, I would just like to outline that um, you can only see the speakers on video. So for the attendees, uh, for the mom moment, your, um, your videos are not uh, on. We can do that at the end of the session if you'd like to. And um, we will record, record all the sessions. So if you would not like to speak and be recorded, feel free to put your questions also in the Q&A tab. Um, and that's about it. So back to you, Volker. Ah, oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. And I have um, really a pleasure to introduce briefly Anne, who Anne McNaughton, who will will have um, the first held the first speech. Anne, I, I read briefly from uh, from her CV. Anne is currently director of the AMU Center of European Studies at the Euro. Australian National University in Canberra, where she was previously um, deputy director. Um, Anna has degrees in arts and law, and um, she completed her first LMA, um, LMM um, at the Eberhards Karl University in Tübingen, a wonderful place to stay, by the way. And um, I'm, I'm absolutely optimistic that you could have um, a few glimpses of uh, Tübingen's social life at that time. Um, and um, after returning to Australia, she, um, she has been an external professor of the university um, for the University of South Pacific. And um, uh, specialized um, in comparative law, European law, and private law of contract and commercial law. And Anne was um, also managing 
conference of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, um, which uh, dealt with COVID-19 already, we came across when we um, discussed um, what to address during our conference and said it's a perfect fit and um, I'm happy to uh, welcome you and Anna and I'm very happy to hear you now. Thank you very much, Volker, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I have a small presentation. So, Juliana, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. And I'll share the screen now. Okay. Now, why is it? Not. Oh, we see your screen, but you uh, see the screen, but it's <laughs> not. Uh, yeah. Let me. Um, okay, let me stop the share for a moment and try it once more. Here it is. Okay, it's it's uh, it's not going to share as a as a as a presentation itself. So I will just leave it like this. There are only, as you can see, only five slides. So uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Falk. It's lovely to see everybody again. Um, good evening and good morning to you all. I acknowledge and celebrate and pay my respects to the Nunawal and Nambri people of Canberra region and to all First Nations Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and work and whose cultures are among the oldest continuing cultures in human history. On behalf of my colleague and friend Eva Wagner, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you at this conference. At the last minute, Eva had a meeting scheduled with Berlin and uh, at this time and so she sends her apologies if it's possible to join a little later, she will. But uh, as these things go, they seem to take uh, quite, a, quite a while, notwithstanding the efficiencies of technology these days. So late last year, let me just, uh, late last year, Eva and I co-edited a volume in the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, Periscope series. Now, this series of the Conrad Adenauer Regional Program for Australia and the Pacific is meant as a lens to broaden our insights, taking in views from different angles. The explanation of the term, the choice of the word periscope continues, and I have it here on the screen for you, that a periscope is the occasional analysis paper series for the Stiftung, and in this way, the uh, concept of Periscope seeks to bring together perspectives, not only from Germany, Europe and Australia, but also New Zealand and the Pacific region. The idea being to augment our understanding of contemporary issues and to help address the pressing problems of our time. And there's no question that COVID is obviously one such question. The Konrad Adenauer Stiftung analysis papers are substantive publications in the form of single author and co-authored contributions, or as in the case of Eva's and my contribution, an edited volume with multiple authors, one of whom is going to be speaking to you this evening. I hope you can't hear my phone ringing in the background there. It's a landline, so it's clearly going to be a nuisance call. Um, in relation to the idea of choosing this particular theme, which was rule of law in a time of COVID, the title having been proposed by Eva, but discussed by a number of us in the matter of state versus liberty and then reflections on the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. The contributions ranged from in-depth analysis and perspectives on the legal questions raised by, the, by COVID and by the 
uh, responses of governments to handling this um, this pandemic. Uh, and Ava and I hope that the publication does exactly what the intention of the Periscope authors proposes. We came to this project as lawyers and each of us has a complementary position vis-a-vis -vis the other. Ava is the program director and coordinator for the rule of law, energy and development policy at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung Regional Program here in Canberra. Uh, as the director of the ANU Centre for European Studies for my part, I took up this position officially last year in March, just as the pandemic was taking hold. And the ANU Centre for European Studies is an ANU-wide platform for transdisciplinary research. The previous director, uh, Professor Jacqueline Lowe, had been or is a post-colonial scholar and uh, very much anchored in the humanities. So as a way to develop the centre and augment its focus, I felt that um, returning to core business in a way and uh, selecting rule of law as the leitmotif for my directorship uh, made a lot of sense, in particular because the rule of law underpins all the disciplines represented in, in and through our centre and is a hallmark of the rules-based international order of which we're hearing so much at this present time. As you can see from the list of contributors that I have here on the screen, uh, in the contents of the volume, the reflections have taken in the views from Germany, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific region. And this is thanks in very large part to Ava's careful curating of the publication. The, yes, the collection is an important collection of essays because it gives an early snapshot of the legal framework and the responses of the state to the developing pandemic. I don't know about the rest of you, but I find looking back at the time when we were putting this, uh, this uh, publication together and reflecting on that and the way the world was at that time, it doesn't just feel like it's 12 months away. It feels like, in fact, it's almost light years away. So the contributions to, the, to this edited collection are really valuable in that, as I said, in that snapshot um, context. The selection of the legal scholars and practitioners was deliberate because, uh, and I realise I'm probably preaching to the converted here, as lawyers, we understand the law and we interpret it in a way that is distinct from non-lawyers and colleagues from other disciplines. I'm finding increasingly as I work across the disciplinary divides that uh, it's extremely important to articulate to non-lawyers why, why words matter, why interpretation matters and why the detail, understanding the detail and the limits of law is so important. But we also understand in a very particular way the question of rights, the exercise of power and authority in a way I suggest that not all scholars of other disciplines do. At a time when the geopolitical challenges are increasing and are of an unprecedented nature, I suggest that it's never been more important for lawyers to make law more accessible to a broader community and to uh, bridge that divide between the what we would describe as the black letter or doctrinal aspects of law, the rules, as well as the broader socio-legal context in which they are placed. Ava and I felt this was particularly the case at a time when there was so much disinformation fake news and conspiracy theories abroad. It's interesting to reflect from an Australian position on the shifts that have occurred in the last 12 months around the confidence in experts, the sobering effect of so much death worldwide on the political differences and divides that were so prevalent at the start of the pandemic, and 
the way in which we will be proceeding in the weeks, months, and I suggest years to come, to find a new way of managing the law, the op operation of the Rechtsstaat, and the scope for balancing the uh, exercise of rights and the exercise of responsibilities. Turning to the publication itself, uh, I will speak just now briefly to Ava's contribution and mine, topping and tailing, because they give a good overview of the, uh, the publications as a whole, but I would encourage you all to please um, take a look at the um, at the the publication itself. The URL is under on the second slide, and of course is available. Both this publication, this uh, PowerPoint, will be made available, but the publication itself is readily accessible and happy to provide information on how to get there if you need it. But um, in terms of introducing the overall uh, program, you can see that we were looking both at the legal frameworks within Australia and New Zealand in particular, and Germany on the other hand, as federations, as states that do have a very strong federalist and also uh, Rechtsstaat or rule of law uh, context and concept. And notwithstanding that, Within the context of these contributions, there were interesting comparisons and contrasts. In relation to the contribution from former Chief Justice of the High Court, the Honourable Robert French, and the reflections contributed by Laureate Professor Emerita Cheryl Saunders, we see some interesting uh, perspectives, I wouldn't say disagreements, but certainly different perspectives on the extent to which uh, the um, legislation and the interpretation of measures was undertaken, the question of proportionality, a theme also picked up in the contributions from the German colleagues, and a, an aspect that Ava particularly emphasises in her introduction. Most of the countries, as we know, imposed similar measures to those that we see here in Australia and that to which uh, Jürgen was referring a little earlier, but also that we have seen in Germany and Europe more broadly. These include questions of social distancing, restrictions on the number of people who can gather in one place, mandatory wearing of face masks, curfews, closures of businesses, schools, universities, entry and exit bans. Indeed, only today we've had the announcement or late yesterday, the announcement of the suspension of flights coming back into Australia from India, which is having a serious adverse impact on Australian nationals of Indian heritage. We also see over time the opening of uh, these border restrictions as we see between Australia and New Zealand. And yet the uncertainty that is created there internationally, as well as the uncertainty that is created domestically, has a long lasting effect on the citizen, on the rights of the individuals, and particularly as we see unfolding now with the uh, vaccination, the rights of groups within society, minority groups, uh, those who are vulnerable, those who are caring for others in the society. Most, if not all measures, affect fundamental freedoms and civil liberties. Uh, they, some of these have the status of human rights. And as we're aware, and this is picked up in the contributions from the Australian perspective, Australia, although a signatory to international instruments concerning human rights, has no state, no national statute or uh, instrument for human rights. The ACT and Victoria have uh, legislative instruments, but these are relatively speaking modest, although important in their own right. The impact on these human rights, including the right of freedom of movement, the right to peaceful assembly, to education, 
uh, and uh, to uh, to to other other aspects, health and the protection and treatment from health treatments. These are all rights that are being impacted by the measures adopted by the state. In order for such measures to comply with the rule of law that constrain the citizen in the interests of the broader community, such measures must not only meet the provisions of the law, but adhere to the principles of proportionality, something that is a principle more uh, readily or more widely accepted perhaps in the German and European context than clearly and uh, explicitly in the Australian context, but nevertheless um, shared equally. And Jürgen no doubt will say a little more about that. Given that there are various notions of what proportionality means and the context in which a measure may or may not be proportionate, the criteria will necessarily vary on the understanding and interpretation of the term. So the, I commend to you in that regard alone the contributions in the, uh, our publication because they explore from different perspectives not only what the context of what the concept of proportionality means, but also the way in which it can a measure can be tested to satisfy the requirements of proportionality. So in her introduction, Ava had set out the concept of proportionality under German law and also under Australian law. And in relation to this concept of proportionality, the reader and others are invited to uh, consider the overall concept of the rule of law and the protection of these fundamental freedoms, given that they sit in tension with one another. This particular tension is starkly demonstrated in the pandemic as it has unfolded both here in, in Australia, in the region and across the globe. Governments have had to balance the fundamental freedoms, individual and collective liberties against the health and well-being of citizens and communities. And the contributions in our publication represent, as I've mentioned already, snapshots of the approaches that governments took at a, an early stage in responding to the COVID pandemic. The similarities and differences evident across the five jurisdictions represented by the contributions, which include Samoa, Fiji, as well as New Zealand, Germany and Australia, provide fertile ground for evaluating the ineluct ineluctable tension between, on the one hand, recognising and upholding citizens' fundamental rights and protecting individual and collective health on the other. The choice of the title, as I've mentioned, State versus Liberty, invites the reader to examine and question this particular dichotomy. It is specifically addressed by Chief, former Chief Justice Robert French in his contribution, where he raises the point of saying that there is a questionable opposition between the state and personal liberty, suggesting that the law and the rule of law, in fact, provide the infrastructure for the exercise of rights and freedoms in democratic societies. However, this tension within the framework between the exercise of those rights on the one hand and the constraints contained in the measures recognising the rights, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as referred to and addressed by Ashwin Raj in his contribution, Balancing Rights and Restrictions, uh, is one that warrants further exploration in the current climate where we really are moving into uncharted territory. The tension is heightened in times of emergency, such as the current pandemic, but the underlying principles remain constant limitations on liberty should be reasonable and proportional to the risks to which they are directed. And this is the first of the two themes that run through the contributions of our publication. The concept of proportionality to which Ava um, addresses considerable 
uh, reflection, as do other authors, but also the theme of the normative role of international convention of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. That instrument being an instrument of the United Nations, it's interesting to note that the term rule of law, in fact, does not appear in the United Nations Charter itself, although it does refer to the peaceful settlement of disputes, the respect for human dignity and fundamental freedoms, the latter being understood implicitly to protect the rule of law. So in terms of the uh, question of COVID, the pandemic, law and society, and our contributions here with the rule of law and the infrastructure of the rule of law, at the end of the day, we find that we're confronted with more questions in a sense than answers. And yet, if we all come to a shared understanding of what is meant by this constant, this idea of reasonable, proportionate control and constraints on the exercise of power, we are likely to be able to navigate these uh, uncharted waters, as I've described them, and to come to an out uh, or a resolution, an outcome that ideally should give all a clearer understanding of how the state in the future moving forward is in fact to negotiate with its citizens, but more broadly, as we're seeing now in the global context, how states collectively are going to negotiate with the citizens of the world. I draw my comments now to a conclusion here, but I'm happy to take any questions or share in the discussion a little later on. Thank you, Falker, again for your introduction and thank you everyone for your attention. Oh, Falker, you need to unmute. <laughs> Sorry. All good. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for your for your interesting introduction um, of of this um, legal aspects. Um, I'm quite convinced that we will, in the end of this whole proceedings, um, very much analyze it in depth. Uh, what happened here in Germany? But uh, what is the current status here in Germany, and what are the legal perspectives uh, which are currently going on? will be um, the light of uh, Professor Jürgen Brömer. But before we come to him, is there any questions to Anne? Yeah, Anne, I, I have a question. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much. It's a very um, thought-provoking aspect. And um, you've also have um, found quite prominent contributors um, to this, to this, um, to this book, I always wondered in the concept of proportionality. Whether it's a big difference if it's enshrined by, say, a constitution uh, in Germany, Grundgesetz, or whether the lack of, um, say, a, a bill of rights in in, in Australia and the constitution per se is 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 something that. Um, is a fundamental different, fundamentally different concept in finding a source for proportionality. I was wondering if if you um, have a, a view or conclusion on, on, on your research on that point. Uh, thanks, Stefan. And um, I know Jürgen's, Jürgen's far more the expert on, on constitutional law and these areas, but from a comparative law perspective and also my own work, uh, more broadly, while there isn't the same level of um, uh, you know, fundamental rule in our system as a common law system, de we've definitely picked up on the concept of proportionality through uh, jurisprudence of the High Court. And it also, and this is my private law, con contract law coming through now, it also informs the fundamentals, to my mind, the fundamentals of the common law. So 
the common law itself is infused with the concept of proportionality, what is proportionate, what is reasonable. Um, that will always depend on the circumstances. In this context where we're in the, in the broader public space, I confess I'm not persuaded. There is, there is clear distinctions with scholarship uh, and uh, uh, academic work. But at the end of the day, when we work through all of that and we look at how that plays out on the ground, I'm not persuaded that there is a significant difference in, um, if you like, a jurisprudential or a case-based uh, concept of proportionality vis-a-vis -vis one that is enshrined in an instrument like the Grundgesetz. I would add that I think as well uh, the the historical traditions, particularly, you know, in, in last century that inform the development. I mean, the Australian constitution is older than the German constitution and the historical traditions that inform both of these are, uh, can't, you know, can't be ignored. And I think that while formally speaking, there might be quite, uh, you know, quite dif a difference in, uh, the structure and how we get to a particular point, I think in terms of the outcome, it's actually not as different as we might we might think because the sources are different. So they're, they're just my thoughts and reflections on that and you know, just one of many. Um, as as we say, it's it's really quite, there is an ineluctable tension there, but um, they're my, my, my reflections on that at least. Can, can I jump in just quickly? <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jürgen, of course. It's uh, um, in, in jest, I can say, you know, the, uh, the Aussies, they take, this, they take this proportionality thing really serious, uh, um, which of course has to do with the fact that it's, it is a foreign object, right? Uh, originally, originally, it wasn't kind of like there. And one of the first acts they passed after Federation, which is another funny thing, is the Acts Interpretation Act. It might have been the, the first, second, or third act that was passed here. So there is actually a statute on how to interpret statutes, right? For anybody with German ears, that sounds kind of like totally outlandish you know, to have a to have a statute on how to interpret statutes. And proportionality wasn't in it. Proportionality came into the Acts Interpretation Act I, some decades later. I forgot when it was, but it wasn't originally in there. And then it was later uh, subsequently entered and. Um, I've frequently come across the term structured proportionality. That's apparently the approach uh, and that they use in Australia. Not that I know, not that I have any idea what structured proportionality is, um, other than it seems to be, as you say, pretty much the same thing that we do kind of like, you know, uh, as a matter of course, but it's almost like a holy, you know, you, know, you read structured proportionality, you take a step back, you freeze in respect, and then you bow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it's no. I, th I, I don't disagree, Jürgen. I've, I've missed you. I've missed you a lot. Um, no, I think that's quite right. And interestingly, I had a colleague do some uh, uh, research on Sir William Dean for memory, and actually look at the way in which he came across now. Uh, I take this under advisement because I'm reaching into the dark recesses of my memory, but my recollection is that he had happened to participate in a course on civil law in, in Europe at some point where the concept of proportionality was discussed and seemed to have taken him quite, um, uh, you know, quite a bit. And over time, then, in some of his judgments from the High Court, this term came in. But yes, the structured proportionality in what way structured actually adds to proportionality, I really couldn't say. <laughs> Very interesting. And um, this brief, um, this brief um, um, dialogue um, uh, makes me uh, very eager to hear more, um, not only from you, Anne, but um, turning rounds uh, from uh, Professor Jürgen Brühl. Well, before um, I give a word to you, um, Jürgen, a brief introduction. Um, you are not native Australian. Um, you may probably hear that. Um, stemming from Germany, has a law degree in, from Mannheim University. And um, uh, 
his doctorate and postdoctoral habilitation from Saarland University in Saarbrücken, which is a very European driven, I guess, and uh, where you worked also on the <laughs> Europe Institute of the, the Saarland University. Um, Saarland is very closely located to Luxembourg, which may have an influence to this location. Um, um, nowadays, you are with the law school of Murdoch University, where you uh, were um, working as a, a dean, not only as a professor in law, at law, but uh, since 2019, you yourself call it, you are free to be professor again and working and um, um, as, a, as a real, as a full-time professor um, of law. Jürgen, I'm very much looking forward to your aspects. All right, thank you, Volker, for this kind introduction. Let me share the screen here. There you go, does that work? Yes. All right. Um, yes, um, uh, Saarland, uh, the Saarland and Saarland University uh, is not only close to Luxembourg, the backside of Saarbrücken um, um, is basically the French border. So it's in that uh, three country, Luxembourg, France, Germany, um, uh, geographical situation. It's a beautiful part of Germany. Um, I am actually from across the border uh, in, in Rheinland-Pfalz. So I am a Pfälzer, um, a suffering one as well, because uh, my FC Kaiserslautern is fighting relegation into oblivion. But uh, be that as it may, the, the Saarland University was a, was a French uh, initiative after World War II to bring some civilization to Germany. And I'd have to say it worked quite well. And the Europa Institute, to which I still have an affiliation, is um, indeed um, one of the one of the shining uh, beacons of Saarland University. Um, uh, and there are a couple of others, uh, in, especially in information science and material sciences. Uh, so yeah, that's my propaganda line for Saarland University. Um, and uh, Murdoch. Um, uh, it's also an interesting place. What I have to say in a European context is that Murdoch University has nothing to do with Rupert uh, Murdoch. Um, in Europe, that um, especially when I changed from, from the University of New England here to Murdoch, um, that um, was a question that was put to me several times, even by my mentor, um, who is actually a very conservative uh, person uh, in, in Saarbrücken but was very concerned when he heard I went to Murdoch University because he automatically thought that this was a private university financed by Rupert Murdoch. Uh, no, it's named after some um, um, academic uh, lit uh, literature professor, Sir Walter Murdoch. Um, apparently a very distant relation to Rupert, like oh, seventh cousin or something like that, uh, beyond my scope of understanding, but uh, nonetheless, not related to Rupert and certainly not to a degree that would put money in our coffers. Uh, so there you go, We're independent public university. Anyway, uh, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, uh, Germany and Australia, some comparisons on stuff that um, has caught my eye, I guess, um, and that I thought might be interesting uh, beyond just uh, the details of uh, measures taken, and so let's uh, let's let's go in and try to change the slide. Why is the slide not there? Uh, I don't know. I couldn't help myself, uh, but to quote this person here, who I thoroughly detest, might I add. You know, there are few few scholars. Uh, um, that I know of that I would detest more than this guy, Carl Schmidt, very controversial, um, but to some degree still celebrated uh, today, uh, political thinker, um, but also a Nazi uh, collaborator and opportunist of um, the highest sort. Uh, but he did have this quote, um, and I guess um, 
it fits in our context as, as we will see the, 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 the very famous quotation uh, that uh, he used um, uh, talking about sovereignty and uh, a much talked about uh, concept, especially in international law, usually used in the wrong way. There was a, in fact, in today's opinion pages of the Australian, Janet Alperson used it again, and uh, of course, totally wrongly, as is usually the case in the media. Um, and he said here that, uh, well, you know, who is who actually enjoys sovereignty? Who is the sovereign? And uh, Carl Schmidt said, well, sovereign is he or she who has the power to declare a state of emergency. And uh, so, you know, have a, you know, let that melt on your tongue a little bit uh, because we are going to come back to it. Um, um, it was already picked up on. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, the, the image with the German health minister Spahn and, and uh, the chancellor candidate of the hearts, as he calls, as he says himself, uh, Söder and, uh, and uh, of course the current chancellor, uh, that picture was taken from, um, from, the, uh, from the website of um, the, that, that party there that uh, doesn't know whether it wants to be a Nazi party or just a conservative, conservative nationalist party. Um, and they picked up on it, of course, um, uh, straight away and um, pinned it under the images that you see there. Um, so um, the discussion around this um, sovereignty um, is kind of like um, floating around. We'll come back to it because I think um, it's uh, a bit interesting, especially in a comparative approach to Germany and Australia to look at that in a little more detail. Uh, let me start with, uh, with uh, the German side of things. Uh, the, mother, the mother of all statutes uh, that um, governs what happens in Germany on the, on the COVID front, um, if you will, is the Infektionsschutzgesetz, the Infection Protection, Protection Act, and um, uh, the core, the core uh, uh, street number there is uh, Section Five um, of the uh, Infection Protection Act. And if you look at Section Five, which of course uh, the image on the far left, which is not put there for you to read, it's just put there as an illustration. To, for you to, to demonstrate how long a single provision can be. Right? So this, the, the, that whole thing on the left-hand side is section five of the Infection Protection Act, okay? Um, so one, um, you know, one might consider maybe going to uh, the relevant drafting departments um, with a little uh, extra schooling on uh, nifty drafting because somehow I have the feeling that cannot be it, uh, a bit long, but the core part, the, co the core part here is at the beginning um, that, um, and, it, and it speaks about the declaration of an epidemiological situation of a national scope. Uh, that is as close as you can get in Germany to the declaration of a state of emergency because constitutionally, we don't have a state of emergency. Um, uh, as uh, some of you may know, um, in the late 60s, uh, at the expense of huge demonstrations in many major cities, um, they tried to introduce uh, or get uh, the Grundgesetz, the German constitution, ready for a kind of emergency situation. And they did uh, uh, succeed in amending and adding um, a few clauses here and there. Uh, but they only, in essence, address uh, the so-called defense case, and that is the armed attack of uh, the uh, geographical area of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany and um, any impediments that might arise out of such a military attack on the workability of uh, the Bundestag, the German parliament, um, and they contain some clauses around that, um, not least uh, that uh, in that defense case, uh, the control, the uh, the commander in chief, um, that, that function will move from the secretary of defense uh, to the chancellor. Um, and so that's relatively minor, but doesn't address a pandemic situation that we have today that um, is not dealt with on the constitutional level, but has found its um, uh, entry into uh, the Infection Protection Act. 
the declaration of an epidemiological situation of a national scope. Now, the interesting bit here is that this declaration is issued by the parliament. So it's issued by the equivalent of the House of Representatives. Um, and it is the House of Representatives that has the ultimate control over the declaration of this um, uh, state, uh, if you will, uh, of emergency. Now, the parliament is bound itself um, by the conditions um, that have been described uh, in paragraph five. And it's interesting that you know, the first uh, that uh, such condition is uh, the work of an international organization, namely the World Health Organization um, and its declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, that is the step, the highest step uh, the, the WHO can reach in the description and classification of health, of a health situation, uh, just short of, um, it's, it's in the hierarchy, it's actually the highest one, but there is also the possibility to call out a pandemic. And if you will remember, the, the WHO was criticized for sticking with the international concern classification too long, uh, and, and, and it's been said it should have called for a pandemic earlier, but, you know, legally you could, you could, probably, you could say that that is really neither here nor there because um, as Germany's Section 5 uh, implies as well, uh, once you have an international or public health emergency of international concern, that's kind of like, uh, you know, red alert, uh, all dicks battle station. Uh, so tying, tying the declaration by the German parliament to the work of this international organization um, is, of course, A, um, makes sense and is plausible from a subject matter, uh, but also objectifies um, the declaration a little bit um, because it links it to somebody who would not have and could not be seen to have an interest in creating a special legal situation within Germany uh, in and by itself. Of course, the problem is that um, an, uh, a health emergency of international concern uh, could uh, inherently not cover something that is inherently only uh, virulent, um, excuse the pun, in Germany itself. So there needs to be um, an, a situation defined where the, where the Bundestag can call uh, such a, uh, uh, declare such a state of emergency uh, irrespective of the World Health Organization. And that happens um, um, as you can see there in number two, um, if there is an infectious uh, spread situation that's taking place or about to take place uh, that extends to uh, several lenders, so that uh, uh, leaves some space for interpretation, whether two is several or whether it needs at least three uh, in, uh, to, to trigger uh, the possibility of uh, such a declaration. Um, but then of course, as we are learning now very fast, uh, even as we speak uh, with the situation in India, um, the potential in one state uh, is, of course, already enough to threaten um, all the others, especially in, uh, in more densely populated areas uh, such as Europe. Um, the state, um, um, and that is what uh, the statute as well uh, says in, in paragraph five, must be repealed uh, if the situation no longer exists. Of course, that sounds clearer uh, than um, it actually is, because uh, obviously that will determine, and we can see that here as well, um, as we speak, um, uh, the considerations that we've had over the weekend here in, in Western Australia as to the assessment of the situation and whether the threat is uh, safe enough, uh, enough now, the situation is safe enough now to repeal our SNAP lockdown. Um, I love these words, no? uh, Brücken lockdown, snap lockdown. We could do a lockdown dictionary, it'd be great fun. Um, the, the state must be renewed by parliament every three months um, and it will cease automatically if it is not extended by parliament. So the idea uh, is uh, that parliament has the ultimate control over, these, um, over this um, uh, state of emergency. Um, section 28 um, was uh, originally the, the section that contained in relatively broad language uh, what could happen uh, if such a situation existed. And in interestingly, it was um, 
uh, very short, um, maybe too short. And uh, for those of you uh, who are more familiar with German law and that what we call Polizeirecht uh, in Germany, the, 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 the law of um, uh, policing, I guess, uh, not in the criminal sense, but uh, policing in non-criminal sense, um, all the, the, which are state statutes in Germany, they all contain what we call in German law, a general clause. Uh, which is kind of like a fallback clause if the special measures uh, don't fit that are also listed in these various police statutes. And in essence, this, this uh, section 28 uh, was very similar uh, to um, this general clause of the policing statutes in the various states and, um, and uh, left out the specifics. Now, this was only recently changed uh, and 28, section 28A was added. Um, and again, uh, the image to the left um, just uh, illustrates to you that um, I didn't do a word count, but that might actually be longer than even section five a little bit, but it, it, it's, you know, they're humongous. And that now lists 17 general measures. So th this is uh, an interesting bit um, uh, going into detail, listing measures uh, in the context of a pandemic, uh, all the stuff that we know, social distancing, contact restrictions, mask wearing, closure of business, sports and cultural events, and all the stuff that we all know about, 17 of them are listed there. Um, and um, it also um, addresses um, a couple of areas that are particularly sensitive, particularly sensitive legally, politically, and particularly sensitive in terms of uh, the potential of being super spreader events, um, as um, we can now so sadly see unfold in India, but we've seen it unfold before, namely public assemblies, uh, which of course are linked to Article 8 uh, of, the, of the German constitution and um, the very important right of um, demonstration, protests and demonstrations and religious services, um, which are of a similar nature and um, uh, extremely important for a lot of people. And uh, both of which of course have implications particularly in a pandemic situation, because uh, it is um, exactly these types of, of um, events uh, that can really wreak havoc. Um, so there is, if you will, a, a special elevated necessity test or call it proportionality test. And uh, uh, linking to our little discussion we had earlier and uh, we, we could honestly ask, you know, is there anything else in that elevated necessity test that is not already contained in the proportionality test, um, other than signifying, if you will, symbolizing the special importance of uh, uh, demonstrations and Article 8 um, and religious services uh, and Article 4 of the German constitution. Interesting um, uh, little side note, uh, because I personally think that this is an area uh, where we have to learn a lot. Um, it says there that uh, the complete isolation of persons or groups is not justified and that there must be a minimum of social contact uh, guaranteed. Um, I think this is very important. I'm not sure whether this has been uh, observed uh, in the past year. I'm thinking of all these people who died uh, under plastic uh, uh, curtains um, in the intensive care wards and in the um, in, in, in nursing home facilities and things like that and were unable to see uh, even their close relatives. Um, I, I personally did not understand why that had to happen. I still don't. Uh, I'm, I may not have enough, no, I'm sure I don't, about the practicality of things. Um, I'm just, uh, have imagined a couple of times, uh, say if my, uh, my two, one of my boys or my wife was in the hospital dying and I would be pounding at the door downstairs and I couldn't go in and I couldn't be with them. I think this is a total shocker. Huh? And um, I'm not sure how that is compatible uh, with this new um, paragraph 28a and I think uh, this is also was a worldwide phenomenon and I think uh, we uh, that needs um, uh, a close look at. 
Um, also, the um, interesting, the technical approach in, in 28A3 on the incident value, um, that's a measurement we don't know of in Australia that could have to do with the fact that there is no incidence, which of course makes um, using incident value as a measurement for anything a bit um, uh, nonsensical. Uh, maybe that's the reason, but it's interesting um, um, how that value has um, persisted. Uh, in Germany and lately against harsh criticism because uh, lately uh, some experts have advised uh, that the uh, the incident value rate uh, you know should be dropped against um, and other measurements for especially uh, people in intensive care hospital care and in particularly in intensive care would be a much better measurement especially if the vaccinations promise uh, hold their promises uh, that they will decrease uh, serious illness um, important legally is uh, Section 30 of the Protection Act uh, because um, it authorizes the lender, the, the German states, uh, to issue delegated legislation uh, for measures, um, for those same measures that I mentioned in 28 and 20, uh, 28A, the 17 plus um, uh, the principal measures. Um, and um, um, it is there where the, the uh, Article 19, Section 1, the, the citation clause of the Constitution is actually can actually be found, and we can see, you know, where the where the the potential problems are: free movement, um, uh, freedom uh, of persons in general, assembly, demonstration, uh, inviolability of home, privacy, privacy, and uh, correspondence are mentioned. I'm not entirely sure why they are mentioned. I'm not entirely sure where uh, Article. Uh, where the, the correspondence post and telecommunications freedom is actually uh, implicated, uh, but I'm sure um, there must be something there. So that's kind of like the, the framework. And for our purposes, because I want to come back to that, it is um, uh, the fact that the parliament is in full uh, control. Now let's shift over to Australia and, and look at the comparison um, and, and the, uh, on a principal scale, if you will, on a macro scale uh, in, in Australia, where the Infects, uh, Infection Protection Act is the Biosecurity Act of 2015, um, is, uh, if you will, on the federal level, uh, where the main music plays, uh, to translate that uh, German proverbial expression. And um, um, in typical Australian manner, that is, um, tries to describe something very important but uh, avoids actually doing so in terms that have anything to do with reality. Um, it uh, states that the governor general is the one who declares the biosecurity emergency. Um, and of course, the governor general um, uh, is the mouthpiece, if you will, uh, but only the mouthpiece. mouthpiece. Uh, the actual power there lies with um, uh, the health minister, and that has to do with this uh, monarchical part of the Australian constitution, which if aliens read it, would lead the poor alien uh, uh, to a totally, totally uh, uh, unreal country that doesn't actually exist, where some woman wields all the power, you know, some, some older woman that sits somewhere else is wielding all the power and exercises it through some guy who's a governor general, who is, of course, if the alien, you know, easy to be misunderstood, who happens to be the chief of the army. So, you know, adventurous minds would think after reading the Australian constitution that this is a military dictatorship um, where uh, the previous retired army general rules. Um, no, it's not, it's actually the health minister. So it's Greg Hunt. Um, now in all seriousness, it's Greg Hunt personally and the statute in section 474 says explicitly so that the powers are, um, must be exercised by the by the minister personally and cannot be delegated so the governor general um, under the constitution ever only acts on advice of uh, the government and in this case on advice of the health minister the only untested, uh, legally untested exception uh, of the governor general not acting on advice of the government is the sacking of the prime minister, which doesn't happen too often, but it's happened once in 1975. And it's still hotly debated whether that was a coup d'etat um, because there was no such advice by the government um, or whether there is some residual uh, executive um, 
prerogative, uh, but not in this, not in our pandemic circumstance where uh, the power rests with uh, um, in the hands of the health minister, not uh, the parliament. Um, and um, no 17 measures here, you know, in the Biosecurity Act, even though uh, Australian um, uh, drafting and, and, and is, is um, if I may say so, and, and you can take that, you can, you can take me by the horns on that, uh, but Australian statutory drafting is definitely worse than German statutory drafting. And I say this in full recognition of section five and 28A that I've depicted on the left for lengthiness. Um, um, it, it, and I think there's a serious side to it. It has to do with um, the notion, the um, I guess a legal cultural notion that parliament has um, a higher ambition to actually determine the content of the statute and not leave it to the courts to interpret and if necessary come back and amend it. Um, many statutes are very long, are very hard to read. Maybe it's also just because there's too many lawyers involved and they are, they're all protecting their fee base. That of course is always possible, uh, but um, it is very complicated. This one is relatively easy as you can see. Um, the health minister may give any direction to any person that the health minister is satisfied is necessary. Um, and there are all kinds of penalties. Uh, penalties are always very important in Australia. If there's not a tree where anybody can be strong to, then it's incomplete. Uh, penalties are always right there. Um, the real, the legal safeguard, the only legal lasso that we have for the health minister, legal, I, I, I emphasize the word legal, is really, as Anne already pointed to, um, the principle of proportionality. Um, and the fact that the measures have to be seen and be demonstrably necessary. Uh, of course, that raises in both cases, the German case and the Australian case, and any case uh, for that matter, um, you know, the issue of um, uh, the facts uh, and, and the question of how much factual discretion um, uh, the, the decision maker actually has. Um, and uh, when we get into a sphere where the courts, for example, um, were left with replacing their subjective assessment of the situation, the factual situation, with that of the executive branch or the legislative branch, it is indeed questionable whether we would be so much better off. Um, the courts need an, uh, an, if you will, an extra factual um, measuring stick uh, that can give their decision, if it were to differ, um, the, the necessary degree of legitimacy um, and so as to not to be seen to just merely hold some kind of partisan not necessarily political partisan, but partisan decision. Um, and that is, um, that is actually very difficult. And I will come back to that um, as well. Um, just a, a little excursion into the states because uh, the Australian states are relatively similar in how they approach these, uh, the situations. Um, uh, in, in, Australia, uh, in, in Western Australia, we actually have two acts, uh, the Emergency Management Act of 2005 and the Public Health Act of 2016, both of which um, empower the relevant minister who has carriage over this, which is uh, in this case here, uh, the Emergency Services Minister and in the Public Health, obviously the Health Minister, to declare states of emergency. Um, and the, the difference between the two is actually not that clear. Uh, they certainly, as we are now seeing in, um, in, uh, in the measures that have been taken, uh, overlap. Uh, Western Australia has declared a state of emergency under both statutes. So we actually have a double state of emergency under the Emergency Management Act and under the Public Health Act. And for example, the, uh, the case uh, decided by the High Court against Clive Palmer uh, when he when he sought entry into WA only to encounter our hero Prime Minister Premier Mark McGowan, who was putting himself up at the border with his hands up front and says, "No, Clive, you must not come into our little sub island." Um, and um, 
uh, that was uh, happened under the Emergency Management Act, even though the travel restriction was, of course, a health caused health, health security anti pandemic uh, protection measure. Um, and so the if you, if you look at the uh, at what the, the two statutes allow, there is um, a lot of overlap. The principal situation in the states is very similar in all of the other states. Um, and uh, so this is a bit of a, of a template um, uh, and how this happens. Similar to Germany, the matter as such is one of concurring jurisdiction. So the, the, the feds have jurisdiction. Um, and in Australia, obviously, as we can see, a lot of that jurisdiction has to do with the protection of the outside borders and travel international travel restrictions, cruise ships, and of course, um, and hopefully we'll have time to briefly touch on that as well, the economic response, the very important economic and fiscal response to um, the pandemic. I'll just skip over this one here. Um, um, it's um, the org chart only demonstrates, if you will, um, by using an image, uh, the, uh, the, the strong emphasis on of the executive branch, right? You can look at an, uh, any of these boxes here, uh, chief health officer, state emergency coordination group, cabinet premier, in the jurisdictional council of Australian governments, right? The only thing that's missing here is anything that has the word parliament in it. Um, it's uh, not, it's uh, in essence, not there. And that has caused um, concern. So what can we say? Uh, what can we say and, and, and summarize so far? Uh, in Australia, the main driver appears to be legally, from the legal framework, appears to be the executive branch, very, very strongly so. The health minister in particular, uh, albeit via the governor general. Um, the premiers who have, who, have, um, who have almost hero status. Now, we had an election here in WA a few weeks ago uh, in which uh, Labour, who have only come to government, Mark McGowan uh, um, is, uh, represents the Labour Party here, who has only uh, achieved government in Western Australia four years ago. So it's not as if WA is a Labour state, uh, far, far from it had a landslide victory here. Uh, the Liberal Party, that in Australia is the party that currently has uh, the federal prime minister, Scott Morrison, not some fringe, you know, the major party um, of the two major parties um, on the federal level has been decreased to two seats in the Western Australian parliament, two, two seats. Mark McGowan won his home seat, which is actually where I live, uh, but I'm not an Australian citizen, so I, I, I was unable to contribute to um, further increase his heroic status, achieved 85%, 85% in his electorate, right? Uh, you know, for those of you uh, familiar with German politics in the past, Erich Honecker dreamt at night from achieving 85% even in a rigged election, right? Uh, he got it in a free election, uh, 85%. And uh, seriously, most of it was due to the fact um, of the strong pandemic response, and in particular to Mark McGowan closing the inner Australian border. Uh, the uh, WA, we love it here, you know, close the border to the rest of Australia, you know, the, the, that, that links up to our, our secessionist uh, inner. Uh, sentiments uh, from from that have never really gone away. But this, um, I'm, I may sound facetious here, but I'm not. This was um, 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 not maybe not the only driver there. The Liberal Party also had its inner dealings, and that had nothing to do with the pandemic. But um, it that was a major driver for a landslide victory, of which I do not know another example on the same scale in any Western country in recent history. Um, and the pandemic uh, helped. Um, so very much executive driven, but, uh, and here, here's uh, uh, what I would put to you and maybe for our discussion. Uh, it also reflects in my view that um, the more, and I'm saying this value free, I'm not making a value judgment um, at all. I'm, I, I claim for myself 
that I'm the biggest fan of the Grundgesetz uh, that walks the earth, maybe in conjunction with others. I'm not saying I'm alone, but um, you know, I, I shall not be beaten on that front. Uh, but uh, uh, the league, the culture here, let's, let's call it the constitutional culture in Australia is much less legalistic and much more politically driven. So whereas the legal framework does, not only appears to, but actually does uh, vest all of that power in the executive branch and into one person, the fact that it is a Westminster type government combined with the fact of um, a majority based voting system leads to a different type of control. Um, the whole government must be in parliament. So you cannot be a government minister unless you have a seat uh, that is prescribed by uh, the constitution section 64. So all of the government ministers are part of the executive branch. Uh, that means they have, they must get re-elected in their own seat. The fact um, that they have majority voting and do not misunderstand me. This is not uh, a pledge uh, to introduce majority voting it has lots of disadvantages, but it, uh, one advantage that it has is um, in normal times, uh, if there is a semi-decent opposition party, the difference between the two parties, what they call the swing that's necessary to shift seats around in Australia is not that large. And there will always be a fair amount of marginal seats. If, if they threaten to swing because the people are not happy with the policies and for example, with the pandemic policy and the measures that are taken, then um, if, 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 that, if that flows through to marginal seats, the loyalty of the uh, holder of that seat can swing really easily away from the government because very quickly will they have to assess whether it is better to stick with the government or whether it's better to knife the government as we have seen so many times uh, in the recent past in Australia where, where prime ministers governments change not because the opposition won uh, elections but because the party room turned when a critical mass of people saw or felt that the next election might cost them their seat. So you don't need to have um, a whole group of, of uh, you know, the, the whole fraction, the whole party room in uproar. Um, if you have 10, 12 members who fear that their seat might be lost, and if that is enough to turn things around, rumblings will start in the party room. And, and, and those, two, those two factors, those two political factors, I would submit, um, are the main engine of control for the extreme legal power vested in one parliament. Because whereas the health minister has all of that power, the, the situation, the position of the health minister as such is rather tenuous. Of course, that requires that there is not a, a situation um, where, uh, for example, now in WA, it would take a little more you know, if the major opposition party has two seats then uh, that kind of safeguard would, of course, work much less well um, as it would in, uh, say, in a uh, situation as we have it in Canberra right now, where basically we're, we're talking a 50-50 situation and even slight shifts um, in, 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 in the party rooms could have big effects. Um, Joe, so, th 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 um, th th thank you very much. It's, it's unbelievably interesting. However, we, we have to, oh, yeah. to look already? briefly, briefly to, 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 to the book. One minute. <laughs> uh, oh, that much. Okay. So in, 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 um, in Germany, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll just put, uh, put that as a point. Uh, the driver is much more, um, I, get, I get three minutes over time. The driver is much more um, uh, legalistic. And we would, we would constitutionally have extreme problems in, in, in having uh, that kind of power vested in uh, the um, executive branch. Um, so you, we can ask, you know, who is actually the sovereign? Who is actually in charge um, of um, the state of emergency? You know, is it the parliament? Is it the government? 
And one point I do want to make, and we can then maybe have that uh, and, and look at that in the discussion is what I have here on the bottom right. And that links back to uh, that I believe uh, the legal and to some degree, the political side, um, at least to some degree obfuscate the actual problem. And the actual problem is experts. Um, we are, um, we are um, you know, looking, we are talking about rights, we're talking about, you know, balancing fundamental rights and, and health measures, we're talking about parliament or executive branch, and that's all important. But behind all of it really um, is not so much a legal problem in the narrow sense as to, you know, what, what fundamental rights mean and, and, and what uh, uh, the, the Biosecurity Act might mean, but uh, the assessment of the situation is actually, I think, um, where the actual um, differences and the actual uh, controversy lies. Uh, somebody has spoken of uh, um, uh, technocracy. Are we, you know, virologists, epidemiologists, uh, intensive care doctors are, have become household names. Um, the word health advice is probably the most prominent word in the Australian COVID political discourse, uh, acting on scientific advice, acting on health. So the, that advice shifts all considerations on the legal and on the political side. And it is um, be interesting to, um, to um, discuss whether that is a, a good thing. And if it is, has disadvantages, is there an alternative even, you know, or are we stuck with it? You know, is, it, uh, is that what it is? Um, and to, to quote our great leader, Donald Trump, you know, it is what it is. Um, he, 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 of course, wanted to say it is not what it is, you know, and wanted to replace the scientific advice by his own nonsense. But, um, you know, is, is, are those the only two options that we have? Maybe we can do this in the discussion. Um, I was Thanks. going to look uh, briefly at the fiscal side of things, but be before Volker comes through the screen and packs me by the throat, um, I'll just uh, not look at the fiscal side of things, even though it's so interesting. Uh, Jürgen, and, uh, I'm too... I'm totally with you. It's so interesting. And I, it's wonderful to see that it really takes you. And when taking it you, you that means you takes us. But uh, I suggest that we, that we skip the discussion at this point in time and um, shift it to the end of, the, um, of, of our uh, conference. I, I know that we actually have someone um, here with us uh, who used to be drafting legislation, by the way, will be interesting. Wow. After so... Well, thanks, uh, by the way, thank you, thank you, thank you for your attention and for inviting me and it was great fun. For me. But, but Volker, I would, I would say thanks. if there are any attendees who have questions, let's, let's quickly hear them um, because I don't know whether uh, Jürgen has time to, to stay till the end. Jürgen, how is your time? No, no, I'm around. I'm around. Of course I'm around. Yeah. Wonderful. Around. So, so, so we skip that at, at this point in time. Thank you very much. Very, very much. It's really, really um, catching you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, now we turn, we turn to um, a very concrete topic, and namely the topic, what, so what is the influence on labor law, which we experienced? And... Um, I'm happy to have um, Christopher representing the German side, what's happening here, and, and uh, later on Stefan on um, discussing and giving us a, a brief overview of what's happening in Australia. But first, turning to um, Christopher. Christopher has um, uh, studied, studied law in uh, Düsseldorf University, has a doctorate from Bucerius School, a private law school in uh, Hamburg, which um, became well known meanwhile, I guess, in Germany, and um, is doing private practice in a very, very sophisticated and specialized um, private law firm um, in uh, labor law topics. Christopher, we are very, very much interested in hearing what's happening in Germany. 
Yes, thank you, Volker, for your kind introduction. Uh, maybe a few words, uh, more, more words about me while I'm trying to share my slide. Uh, I found my way to Gapla about Claudia, who was my teacher during my election stage um, while my referendariat, uh, which I did uh, with Resolve in Sydney. And now I'm working for uh, yeah about two years uh, at uh, Vanguard, uh, which is a yeah employment law firm in Germany. So I hope you can see the slides. Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes, we can. So I will give you a short overview about yeah the direct and also the indirect consequences. Um, that uh, the COVID-19 crisis yeah, brought to the employment law. Um, as you can imagine, um, in particular, the employment law um, yeah, is affected in many ways by the corona um, pandemic. Um, a lot of business is, um, has to, or had and still has to, to shut down. Um, of course, um, the work or many workplaces um, are very endangered to, to become a cluster of um, a corona uh, infection. So there are yeah, many regulations um, that um, became uh, yeah, came into force within the, the last um, month. And um, I will give you a short overview about these regulations today, um, which is at first um, the short time work, which was not created um, special to this, um, to cushion the um, consequences of the Corona uh, pandemic, um, but it um, was not well used within the last um, few years, but yeah, it, got a boost um, yeah, within the, the last uh, month. Then um, I will uh, talk about um, two very present um, regulations, uh, which are the uh, home office obligation. I will uh, explain later why I put this obligation into quotation marks and the obligation to offer Corona antigen rapid tests. And after that, uh, I will give you a very brief in, uh, overview about indirect consequences um, of the COVID-19 crisis, um, which um, in particular affects actors of the platform economy. But first of all, the short time work or in German Kurzarbeit, uh, what does that mean? Short time work means the temporary reduction of the regular working hours and also the corresponding remuneration due to a, consider a considerable loss of work. So um, as employer, uh, you can reduce the work proportionately or also completely uh, if you yeah, can't offer um, some work to uh, your employees due to, um, because maybe you have to, to close down your business or you don't get orders from third parties or something like that. So it's called the zero short time work or Kurzarbeit Null. The goal of short time work is to overcome temporary crisis uh, at the moment, uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, to avoid dismissals for operational reasons. And uh, from an uh, employment view, um, you always have to make a very strict distinction between the basic principles of the labor law and the social security law. Which principles these are, are these? Um, the basic principles of labor law that um, you have to be aware of um, as an employer is at first you can introduce short time work only um, if you have um, yeah a special basis 
um, in, in labor law. This can be and often is uh, a collective bargaining agreement, for example, um, in, the, uh, in the public sector, it's the um, TVED, Tarifvertrag für den öffentlichen Dienst. Or um, often it is an agreement uh, between the employer and the works council. Or if there is no collective bargaining agreement and no works council, um, then at least uh, you have to find uh, regulation even uh, in the employment contract, or you have um, to agree with the uh, employee and to uh, sign an addendum to the employment contract or additional um, regulation uh, that allows you as employer to introduce short time work. According to case law, um, this basis agreement must at least regulate um, the start and the duration of the short time work and also the selection of the employees affected because, for example, you don't um, have to um, bring all your employees on short time work. For example, if the administration uh, still have uh, some work, but the production uh, haven't worked, so you can say, okay, um, the employees that I have in uh, the production, um, they have to go on short time work. Um, so it could be that there's only or that there are only um, a part of, of all employees that are affected. And so you have um, bring that into your um, regulation and your agreement. Um, what is if the if you don't have a collective bargaining agreement and you don't have um, a work agreement um, and the employee says no I don't want to sign uh, this agreement and um, I don't want to go uh, into short time work then theoretically you can um, speak out uh, yeah so called änderungskündigung this is a dismissal with the aim to change the working conditions um, like you want this as an uh, employer, but um, this is only uh, theoretically vis uh, visible because um, there are very, very high hurdles set by the labor courts um, to get uh, such a dismissal um, um, valid. Um, to be honest, I don't know even one um, judgment by one labor court um, which said okay uh, a dismissal with the um, goal to uh, change uh, the working conditions and, and to introduce short-term work is, is valid i think there's um, yeah no no um, judgment um, uh, till now so um these are the basic principles of the labor law that you have uh, to be aware of, um, as an employer. And then there are also basic principles um, of the social security law because the short time allowance or Kurzarbeitergeld um, is granted by the Federal Employment Agency um, yeah, with the goal to cushion the disadvantages suffered by the employees because if they work less than uh, agreed they of course uh, get less remuneration and um, to fill this 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 gap um, the short time allowance is uh, granted by the federal employment agency um, there are many very complicated um, requirements that you have to to prove and to to fulfill as employer to um, get this short time allowance. Um, for example, it's, um, you have to, to um, show that there's a substantial loss of working hours due to economic, uh, economic reasons or a temporarily avoidable event for at least 10% of the employees. Then um, this yeah, event uh, must must uh, unavoidable, um, which for example means if um, the employees still have um, claims for vacation leave, then you have um, at first uh, grant uh, this this uh, vacation leave before you can uh, get short time allowance and so on. And um, yeah, at least 
this short time allowance, if you uh, get this um, amount um, at least to 60%, uh, percent, uh, that's the case um, if the uh, employee has no children, and 67% if uh, the employee has um, at least uh, one children of the net pay difference, and it will be paid for a maximum of 24 months. So that uh, that are the basic principles and um, yeah now I will show you um, yeah how important this this instrument um, became in, in, in Germany um, within the last uh, yeah year um, because um, as you can see on this slide uh, according to data from the federal employment agency at uh, yeah, even in January 2021 uh, there were 2.85 million employees in Germany um, who uh, got short time allowance and we had an absolute record month in April 2020 when uh, around 6 million employees, uh, which is 70.9% of all employees in Germany were on short-time work. And yeah, if you compare this to the peak of the financial crisis, this was the, the last um, time frame where short time, or the instrument of short-time work was uh, used very well in Germany. Um, we had um, at the peak of this crisis, um, yeah, more, 1.44 million people on short-term work. So you can see how important this instrument became uh, during the, uh, the um, COVID-19 uh, crisis. And um, yeah, it's a very, um, very uh, important instrument uh, even to avoid uh, dismissals for operational reasons. So, now I will come to the home office obligation. Um, the force act for the protection of the population in the event of an epidemic situation of national significance, terrible name. So um, it's better known as Corona Notbremse Gesetz in Germany um, has come into force and um, it contains um, different um, changes and uh, regulations. Um, which become um, binding for employers with immediate effect. And yeah, it's very present because uh, it uh, has come into force uh, even uh, in the last week. And um, with this Corona Notbremse Gesetz, um, there was also a change uh, in the Infection Protection Act, um, which um, Professor Brömer was already referring to. And for yeah, the employment law and for um, the employers, the section 28B, para 7 of this uh, Infection Protection Act um, is very important because um, it reads as follows. Uh, as you can see, in the case of office work or comparable activities, the employer shall offer the employees the opportunity to carry out these activities in their homes if there are no opposing compelling operational reasons. The employee shall accept this offer in so far as there are no reasons for them not to do so. So what does that mean for employers and also for employees? I have a short overview. So the consequences for employers, they are obliged to allow all employees who work uh, in, in office or carry out um, activities uh, which you can carry out uh, in in uh, office um, yeah to he has to to, to grant them uh, to to work uh, in in their home office um, and uh, he only can waive uh, this this right to work uh, uh, from home if uh, the employer has um, compelling operational reasons um, yeah which uh, uh, not allowed to the, the employee to to work in uh, his home office. Yeah, for example, this can um, be um, yeah uh, um, reasons um, that uh, considerably restrict the operational process or could not be maintained at all. But um, the the hurdles um, are, are very high there for for employers. Um, for um, not granting home office. Yeah? For example, uh, if you just say, okay, I don't have the IT equipment, 
um, yeah, then you have um, maybe a reason for some days or some weeks, um, but uh, then uh, you, you have to, to uh, look that you do to that you get uh, this IT equipment um, as employer and um, give the employee the, the opportunity to use this IT equipment uh, at home. So uh, such reasons um, can be a reason for some weeks, but not uh, cited permanently. And um, yeah, as employer, um, you have to explain uh, if you have some conflicting reasons and you have to, have to explain this uh, to the Occupational Health and Safety Authority. So the, the hurdles are very high for employers. But uh, that's not uh, the same for, for employees because um, in general, the employees are obliged to take advantage of such an option that is granted by the employer. But um, as employee, you can refuse to work in a home office uh, very, very easy because you just have to say, oh, no, um, there are third parties that interfere in my work uh, in the home office, for example, my children, yeah, or um, I don't have um, a room where I can uh, work properly. Um, yeah, and for this purpose, you just have to uh, um, notify um, the, the employer um, that there are conflicting reasons and uh, you don't have to do more. And so, um, yeah, the hurdles for employees to refuse home office work are very, very low. And um, that's why I put this obligation in quotation marks, because it's more of an appeal than uh, an, an obligation um, to, to work in the home office. But then there is a real obligation um, for, for um, the employers. Um, and this is the obligation to offer Corona antigen rapid tests. Um, which um, become into force um, even last week. Um, it's regulated in the SARS-CoV-2 Arbeitsschutzverordnung. And according to this uh, Verordnung, uh, employers um, must uh, at least twice per calendar, uh, must at least um, offer two uh, Corona antigen rapid tests per uh, week. And um, yeah, violation of this violations of this this obligation to offer these tests um, can be punished by the authorities uh, with very high fines. I think it's going up to thirty thousand uh, euros. So um, yeah, you definitely have to to um, ensure as employer that uh, you offer these um, tests to your employees. So it's up to the employer um, how to uh, yeah to decide how he uh, ensure that the tests are offered. Um, for example, you can procure these tests and offer it uh, to your employees. You also can engage a third party like a doctor or a test center um, to offer these tests to your employees. Of course, all costs of uh, these tests um, has to be borne by the employer. And um, yeah, this regulation uh, at the moment, um, it, uh, it's valid until the 1st June of uh, 2021. And um, as an evidence, if the authority asks, okay, um, did you offer these tests to your employees? Um, you should keep um, the um, bills or um, agreements with third parties. Um, to prove that uh, you fulfill your obligation. Um, then there's yeah, uh, uh, still a problem because uh, this, this obligation uh, for employers to offer this test is not linked to an obligation of the employees to use this test. So the employees are totally free in their decision if they uh, want to take uh, this, these tests and uh, accept these tests and uh, um, to use these tests uh, every week. Um, so you can ask yourself um, how sensible is an obligation to offer tests uh, if there is no obligation to use these tests. But um, the, the problem to introduce obligation for employees to use these tests 
um, yeah, is that um, such an obligation to, to test uh, interferes with um, yeah, fundamental rights of the employees, um, in particular, the, the uh, right of physical integrity and um, also the right uh, of the employees um, to privacy. So that's why there's no obligation for the employees to use these tests. But uh, what um, you can see at the moment, um, there are initial singular decisions of labor courts that uh, say, okay, if um, the employee um, refuses to, to use these tests, uh, then um, the, the employer um, can say, okay, if you, don't use this test, uh, then um, you, uh, I don't allow you to work because it's maybe it's, it's, a, it's a danger for your colleagues um, or um, other employees. Um, and uh, I um, refuse uh, your access to um, uh, my company premise. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's um, very interesting um, how these uh, decisions uh, will develop. Um, but there are, yeah, at the moment, there are the first singular labor courts that um, say, okay, if um, the, the employees don't use these tests as employer, then you have the opportunity to uh, refuse assess. So that's a um, short interview, or that was a short interview, uh, overview um, on the direct consequences. And now I will give you a brief overview of the indirect uh, consequences, because of course, um, there are always uh, uh, profiteers of uh, crises and also of the COVID-19 crisis. And um, from a labor point uh, of, of view, uh, these are the actors of the platform economy. So what is platform economy? It describes an innovation of the digital uh, work um, yeah, which already has become normality for many workers and also, um, yeah, it's more and more present in uh, all our lives. Um, for example, if you um, order um, your food with, uh, in Germany, it's, it's Lieferando, I think in, in, in Australia, it's, it's Fudura. Um, or um, if you use uh, the, the services of Uber, then this always is, is part of a platform uh, eco economy. And these actors of the platform economy um, currently experiencing a, a boost. And um, yeah, of, of course, um, it, it always brings negative impacts. Um, in particular, very precarious working conditions, inadequate uh, uh, remuneration for the workers on these this platforms. Uh, also, um, often um, they are not seen as, as employees by the, the platform, um, by, the, by the crowd services, but um, working on um, independent uh, contracts. So they often don't have claims for social security. And Therefore, um, the um, Bundesarbeitsministerium, the Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, um, currently is closely observing um, how this platform economy is developing in Germany. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, we will get um, regulations on, on this platform economy within the, the next year, uh, the next years. Um, so, for example, at the moment, um, there, uh, yeah, there exists um, a position paper um, created by the uh, Bundesarbeitsministerium, which contains um, very interesting points and ideas um, of the Bundesarbeitsministerium, how they uh, want to regulate uh, this, this uh, platform work. Uh, I've, um, put down or wrote down the, the key points of this position paper. Um, so according to the um, Bundesarbeitsministerium, they uh, will try to include platform workers into statutory pension insurance, health insurance, and uh, accident uh, insurance, and uh, something like this. They want to introduce 
um, binding minimum notice periods. Um, they also want regulations uh, on um, payment of um, yeah, sick payment or vacation leave payment. And also, which is very interesting, uh, they want to introduce a burden of proof which favors platform workers. So if the platform worker, uh, um, uh, worker provides indications uh, that uh, his work um, uh, that he yeah, carry out is his activities not um, on basis of an independent, uh, independent contract, um, but on the basis on an employment relationship, um, then the burden of proof that this is not the case uh, rests of the plot, uh, platform operator. So um, this is very interesting um, how this uh, whole matter will, will develop and uh, uh, which regulations uh, maybe we will get uh, within the next few years. So that was my uh, short overview about uh, the, the consequences uh, of the COVID-19 uh, crisis for the German employment law. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this uh, quick overview, Christopher. Um, after after um, touching um, the overall question of, of infection, uh, infection um, and epidemic measures altogether uh, on, a, on, a, on a state level, um, we came came to to uh, the measure of of, uh, of what's happening in in labor law matters. And um, um, after hearing you on uh, labor law measures here in Germany, we turn around and um, we will have the discussion afterwards. I suggest um, on what happened um, um, with employments and employ employers and employees in Australia. Um, I'm happy to introduce briefly Stefan. Stefan uh, grew up in Ulm, which is not far away from where I live today. Um, he studied in Tübingen, um, and I guess uh, you know it quite well. And um, you migrated to Australia in 2003. In Germany, you worked uh, as an in-house counsel for the German Council of Trade Unions. And um, in Australia, after a, a short um, hint to major trade union in Sydney, you were um, admitted as a solicitor in 2010. And since then, working in uh, private practice, I guess, since 2017. I'm happy to have you here on board, Stefan, and I'm very anxious to learn more about Australian labor law. Thank you very much, Volker. And um, can you just let me know, I'm not too familiar with the PowerPoint, if, if you can see the slide. Wonderful. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Um, when I looked at the um, uh, usual channels to prepare for a presentation like this, there's a website called Workplex Express, which is a subscriber-based service for specialist employment law research. The topic for the COVID was the 2020 coronavirus pandemic. They left that title. Um, and we're near the end of April 2021. Um, it looks like we still have a mountain to climb um, on that topic. To present an overview of how COVID influenced employment law in Australia, broadly speaking, it has influenced government policy, occupational health and safety, legislation, and also the players themselves, the unions, the employees, the employers, the federations of employers, the judges, the commissioners of the tribunals. I have um, a practice area that is partly based on employment and commercial and family law. And due to my experience as a litigation barrister, I uh, predominantly focus here on some of the cases I've been involved in, in the hope that it can shed some, some light on the complexities but also talk briefly about government initiatives, particularly the, the vexed issue of JobKeeper and the running out of JobKeeper of the subsidies um, 
uh, last month. The one of the cases I was involved in had some attention in in the media, particularly because it, it was a specific circumstances. Firstly, the mining industry is 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 a very strong um, and, and important industry in Australia. Um, there, there are certain phenomena in Australia we'll talk later about, which is the fly and fly out workers. Um, Australian um, uh, listeners will, will, will know about that uh, concept, but um, I find it astonishing that because of what's referred to as the tyranny of distance, most mine sites are very remote. And many mine workers are flown in from their home bases to mine sites, work usually 12 hour shifts, and then flown back to the home base. And due to the huge profit margins, um, it makes actual economic sense to do so. Um, the impact on the miners themselves and their families is a different matter, but the money is good and it's still pursued by a lot of uh, uh, employees. What happened in, in the case of BHB was um, an example where a well-intended policy can have unintended consequences. Um, in that case, the mine site itself introduced a policy that said, if you are an indigenous worker and you're 50 years of age or more, if you're a non-indigenous worker and you're older than 65, or if you're a non-indigenous worker above 60 with a pre-existing health condition, you are uh, not allowed to work on the site. Um, very generous provisions provided for uh, paid leave while you stayed at home. But uh, the industry itself is characterized by a, what's called a labor hire uh, model. That means a large proportion of the workforce is not directly employed by the mine site, but by a contractor, a labor hire agency. And the consequence of that policy was that indigenous workers, Aboriginal workers more than 50 years of age, uh, the other group 65 years plus, or those with the pre-existing conditions um, uh, uh, and above 60 years of age, eventually ran out of money um, and suffered hardship. Um, the mine side BHP and um, uh, defences were, it was also reported in Sydney Morning Herald, the defence of the mine site was that they um, said, firstly, we have, and there's a government advice that says we have to do what we have to do. Um, and, on, and also the employees themselves are not our employees. Um, it's, not our, it, it's, it's not our fault and we don't have to pay indefinitely as we do generously for our workers. So the complexity was, was a mixture of uh, the Fair Work Act, Age Discrimination, Racial Discrimination Act, um, and, and frankly, it was a, a hot and difficult topic to take a case like that. In, 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 it was the height of COVID and no one knew exactly what, what it would mean. And in a way, an employer uh, on the face of it might have appeared to do the right thing. The, the, the union, the construction and CVMEU that instructed me to, 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 to act for them, uh, however, said that a one-size-fits-all policy leads to consequences that are dis discriminatory and um, our pleadings went to that effect. For example, why is it that as a general rule, if you're indigenous and you're healthy, if you're 50 years old, uh, why should you uh, not be allowed to, to turn up when someone else has a, a you know, is, is non-indigenous, perhaps overweight, but no other conditions who is much older than you up to the age of uh, uh, 65? or 60 with a pre-existing condition can work. One of the arguments the, the, the uh, employers put forward when discussions occurred with the unions prior to us going into legal action was because of the remoteness of some of these sites, uh, there's a danger that in, some indigenous workers might take uh, uh, the, the virus back in communities that have not access to health, uh, 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 readily available health services readily available However, that, that didn't apply to most of the sites. And, and it was also, it became clear, and that's also the complexity of this topic. It became clear that 
the government advice, once you start looking for it, wasn't as actually as detailed. They were just general advice on people who might be more vulnerable if they catch such an illness. Um, the outcome of this case was, was a settlement I can't, I can't disclose, but it, it showed that it was obviously taken serious by the companies, um, including the, the labor hire agencies, but also showed that a policy, if it's, if it's applied in one size fits all, can have uh, unintended consequences. The JobKeeper scheme itself um, was, I, I think it's a 100 billion scheme, depends on who you ask, uh, but the idea was to, um, uh, in, in perhaps a, a surprising shift to big government, the idea was to uh, go in and go, go hard uh, in, in pumping up the economy to not be left uh, dry in circumstances where uh, companies had significant losses. Um, it stopped on the 28th of March, 2021. It, it was actually reduced over a period but it, it, is, it is certainly something that has very significant impacts. So businesses now have to fund the payroll themselves. Um, it, the expectation is that um, some will let staff go or close the doors. On the other hand, um, Australia has weathered the storm uh, remarkably well compared to other countries and it will remain to be seen what the impact is. Geographically, the Top 10 postcodes that depend on JobKeeper uh, out of those 10, seven are in Melbourne. So um, the media attention on me uh, Melbourne in the lockdown was particularly strong. Um, and it showed that the effects are there. Uh, there's a just received, re released Reserve Bank Financial Stability Review that says um, that the firms that will likely go broke in the aftermath of government support ending will not be the big household names, not the big employers, but the small medium enterprises, small shops, restaurants, couriers, etc. Most of these are, or some of these, majority I would say are um, secured by, uh, uh, or the bank that, that's are secured by business owners homes. So it, 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 it will Remains to be seen whether or not the banks could end up owning quite a few houses in, in Melbourne, hopefully not, but especially in highly exposed Western suburbs um, for, for that in, uh, in, uh, in that regard. The words have been coined, job keeper becomes dividend keeper. It's a phrase from the Australian Financial Review. Um, the other headlines from ABC were business pay dividends and bonuses from the profits generated by job keeper. It's not a good look. Uh, there's a push pros for JobKeeper payments to be returned as profits, dividends, boom. Now, the whole point of JobKeeper was obviously to bankroll companies that might have to sex staff otherwise because of big revenue declines because of the pandemic. And uh, the way it was done is, was partly based on the prediction of um, uh, profit loss that never eventuated. Uh, there was sense in that, in, in my view, because you wanted to avoid the companies that go well to, 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 to do badly and then perhaps get the money too late. However, some recipients of the subsidy have not appeared to have any revenue decline at all. And uh, it has come about that there has been a, 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 a shortfall in, in scrutiny from the regulators and the companies are actually allowed to keep the job keeper even if they turn a, a huge profit. Examples are that 75 of the ASX 300 companies helped themselves to a total of 2.45 billion in JobKeeper subsidy in the calendar year 2020. Qantas was the biggest one, um, but the question is really, um, and that's probably not so much a legal, but a policy issue, to what extent um, should they be asked to return JobKeeper? The flip side is that a lot of people fell through the cracks of JobKeeper. The biggest groups are migrant workers, international students, arts workers, and, and casual workers. The way this scheme was designed is that JobKeeper doesn't cover people on temporary visas. There are more than 1.1 million temporary workers in Australia. Most come from China, India, followed by the UK, South Korea. Um, and Basically, they were told literally by treasurers 
to go back to their home countries where possible. Uh, a substantial chunk of those migrant workers were international students, 500,000 of them. Many are casual workers, so they weren't long-term casuals who were also not covered by JobKeeper or haven't been in their current job long enough, that is 12 months, to, to qualify for support. Um, they were again told um, to go home um, if possible. And um, it might not be known, but the uh, education is, is, a, is a huge economic factor in Australia, as, as Jürgen um, and, and Anne could, could attest. And um, in my view, and that's a personal opinion, the reputational damage of not looking after international students uh, will be long felt. Uh, usually they're the elites of, of their countries that can afford to be sent to Australia. They have been not treated well and not been looked after. And it'd be interesting to see what they report when they go back to their home countries. But as I said, that's my personal view on that point. Um, the government has reacted in April and unveiled an 18 billion relief package for the uh, tertiary sector. That was in April last year. But again, the education minister said it was, and the quote is, unashamedly geared towards domestic students. And international students have been told by Scott Morrison to, to go home. The art sector is another one that contributes about 100 billion to Australia's GDP per year. Um, usually because of the structural realities, they do not really align with the requirements that the JobKeeper scheme has, and um, particularly because of some of them not being employees, some of them being casuals um, and being on short-term short contracts and also migrant workers. So that's another big area. Um, and I've noticed with interest, not that I quite understand the uproar currently in Germany with, with, the, with the video of, of some German actors. I think they probably went the wrong way about it, but it's certainly an area uh, that has been neglected and fell through the cracks. The other ones are the, the casual employees that are obviously, um, if you hard hit if you haven't been in a job for 12 months, so you, again, you would not um, fall through it uh, uh, from the definition of, of uh, uh, casual employees. Um, there is a, a, a job seeker entitlement that's a, a, a lot less than um, the job keeper. It's roughly about 565 per fortnight. Poverty definition is it depends on who you ask, but it's usually set between 816 and 1,100 per fortnight. So um, it is certainly a situation that um, uh, the economy is trusted to, to pick up these, uh, these, these employees. Um, getting back to the impact on, of COVID in, in, in cases, I, I had to look at uh, another matter I was involved in was a casual nurse who made, made inquiries about the lack of protective equipment in an aged care facility. Uh, and we all know that was one of the areas, unfortunately, hardest, hard hit by, by the COVID impact. Um, casuals um, is a phenomenon that is uniquely, um, probably perhaps in the Anglo-Saxon world, but particularly in Australia, uh, an employee that is defined as an employee, but has no entitlement to any guaranteed hours. Uh, so she's been what's called a long-term casual. So she's been there for a number of years, had regular shifts, a roster that was given there in advance. But after the complaint, miraculously, uh, her shifts were, shifts were reduced or uh, in some cases, she was not given any other work. Um, she eventually uh, left uh, and it was a case that went before the Fair Work Commission. But again, like most of these matters eventually, uh, they, they settle um, on, on, a, on a basis that I can't further disclose, but it just shows um, the uh, difficulties um, uh, of making complaints um, when you're a vulnerable worker. Of course, there, there, there are other sites uh, that uh, employers will, will tell you. Uh, one really big issue is whether or not it's okay to dismiss or fair to dismiss workers who refuse to do a vaccination. And uh, the commission really grapples with that. And I think it ties in with uh, personal liberties versus um, uh, OHS issues, duties of care. 
um, and, and, and other factors. Uh, some upheld dismissals in early learning centres, uh, whereas in aged care facilities, some said, look, um, maybe there's a right to refuse it if you have the, the appropriate medical evidence. So um, it, it, the jury is still out there. I think it would take a few full bench decisions to get a clear guidance on it. When um, the minister was still for employment, was still uh, Christian Porter, um, he released a statement saying that the overwhelming majority of employees should assume they have no power to force employees to vaccinate against COVID. Um, that was his latest guidance from the Fair Work Ombudsman in South Wales, Australia. Um, and uh, they had meetings, roundtable meetings with employers and unions, um, and that reinforced the government's broader policy uh, supporting voluntary vaccination. So it, it, it will be seen to what extent um, the uh, compulsory nature of uh, of uh, vaccinations will be upheld. In my view, it will depend a lot on the industry, um, on, on, on the quality of the evidence as well, um, and, and to what extent um, uh, the, the, the employees um, have, ha, have, have an argument to say that why the, particularly those, those employees should be excluded. The area um, of law that has also been um, in heavily influenced by, by the pandemic is uh, wages are set in Australia by way of, uh, they don't like to call it minimum wages in the ward system, that is a collective bargaining agreement, but it's, it's ultimately set by, by, by the commission with submissions from all interested groups, unions, employers, experts from academia and, 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 and other uh, other uh, 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 expert evidence, and they are grappling with the uh, with, with 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 the conflict of, on the one hand, not stifle the economy, but on the other hand, realizing that um, um, uh, hopefully there's a trickle down effect with with pouring more money in the economy. So uh, they're all inviting um, submissions at the moment, um, uh, and it's it's also an area that. Um, uh, is going to be heavily influenced by the by the uh, uh, by the COVID situations. Um, the experience in the court has been that um, uh, some courts were very quickly in adopting um, uh, MS teams, the equivalent of, of of Zoom, to to go on with the with the hearings. Um, some local courts they they it took a bit longer. Um, uh, but all in all, I have to say my experience with the legal profession has been that they adopted very quickly to, to these changes and, and showed a lot of um, tolerance also to some difficulties some people had with the technology. Um, I understand um, uh, that I could only give you a, a, a brief overview. I'm, I'm happy to, to obviously engage in, in further discussions, but if you haven't seen that video, um, watch it. Um, it, 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 is, it is showing how difficult it can be uh, for uh, poor Rod Pendon in this situation uh, with the difficulties of the Zoom meetings. Um, I tried to play it earlier, but I, 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 would, you know, I had to go through a lot of ads, so I don't want to expose you to, to, to those if you go to YouTube. But um, it, if you want to see if someone acts with grace under fire, it was poor Rod Hampton, who went, is the cat, who had to ensure the judge, I think he was in Texas somewhere, that he's not a cat, but he doesn't know how to get the Zoom filter off it. And um, it was also clearly shown by uh, the other members of the profession that they showed a great deal of collegiality to deal with poor Rod Panton. Uh, that concludes the, the, the very brief overview um, uh, on, on, this, on this topic. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very, very much. It's really a tour de raison. We end up in individual cases. Thank you very much for giving us such a, a close look to the real front, which is going on in um, employees' law. <clears throat>
So, whoa. Um, at, at, at the end of, of, of this, uh, this um, um, session, we come now to discussion. And um, I take, um, take the freedom of my role in, in uh, raising the first question um, or remark to Jürgen. If I see what happened here in Germany, um, of course, we have wonderful laws and the parliament is empowered here and there and is the ruler of the whole game. So far, I was not under the impression that the parliament really was in control of the whole thing, but the certain governments. So to me, the picture seems not to be too difficult, too different from what's happening in Australia. Uh, I would not necessarily disagree. I would just add that uh, uh, it is my impression that uh, from a, if you will, from a constitutional perspective, it is really neither the executive branch nor the parliament that is really in the driver's seat. It is the technocracy, the, the, it's the expert that's are, that are driving it. And because we can, of course, discuss uh, how difficult it is to, um, to overcome, especially in a, in a pandemic situation, uh, expert advice. Uh, if, somebody, uh, if somebody risks a different risk assessment, uh, they have to put things on the table that are, that are really impossible to argue and uh, which explains why nowhere in the world have I heard anybody openly say um, we need to be less careful, we need to pay less attention to incidence rates and infection rates, we just need to cop more people to die. Right? That, that, Cause that's the consequence. Uh, put it on the table, right? Let's say, you know, okay, we have a death rate uh, of, I don't know, you know, let's put it at 100. Um, we need to put it at 150, uh, you know, per whatever, right? Uh, in order to have the economy going, in order to have our liberties going. Nobody is saying that, not even Trump was saying that, uh, but that is the consequence. And uh, we usually, there are other fields of constitutional law where we have similar considerations we, that are not discussed. Of course. We, of course, accept death rates in individual traffic, right? We, we have taken it on that people die in car accidents, totally unnecessarily, but they do. In the US, you have a big debate about gun control. That's predominantly a control as to how many lives the freedom in, in the Second Amendment is actually worth, right? And the, uh, the, the, the proponents of gun freedom are willing to, to take 20, 30,000 lives for that freedom. Right? And we have to do the same calculation in the pandemic. Uh, if we, if you know, everybody, everybody who says we need to loosen up or we're going overboard and we're having, we, we had this debate today in WA in the media, uh, that's fine. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I have full understanding for that discussion. I, I have full sympathy for small and medium business owners who see their livelihood go down the drain, their blood and sweat over the last 20 years. You know, thinking that some of this has gone overboard just this last weekend. One case triggered a lockdown over an, a holiday weekend. Can you imagine what that did to some people? I have full understanding of that. But you got to put the facts on the table. Uh, pe people are going to get very sick and people are going to die. And you can't have your cake and eat it. And I, so a bit more frankness um, and a bit less deference on that front to the, you know, the virologists will tell us if you do this, the incidence rates and the disease rate will go up. But it's a political discussion whether we're willing to cop it or not. And we don't have that courage to really discuss that question. Yeah, thank you. Additional questions? Yeah, um, Folke, can I jump in on that and uh, yes, please. follow up? Because um, I think Jürgen's raised a, a few valuable points there. And as you say, Jürgen, one of the key things is that, um, so listening to your presentation and the, the final slides around technocracy and democracy, whereas in the EU, you've got the commission, which is really genuinely a, a, a technocratic system. As you say here, the 
in the Australian situation, but also in the German situation and in, either, in these other countries where they're the politicians are taking the advice from the health experts. The fact remains that, as you've just said, the decision is taken by the politicians and there's the lack of political courage and political will to actually engage with that and to say, these are the trade-offs and these are the really difficult challenges. And one of the, one of the areas which doesn't come to the fore when there is this argument about opening up the economy or not is that when there are more instances of, uh, of the virus and greater illness, this is a heavier burden, not only on the frontline carers, so the doctors, the nurses, but also their families and their support networks. And there are two issues there. One is the, the if you like, the mechanical question of resourcing that because it takes a lot of time and, uh, and, and money to train up uh, the doctors and the nurses and the people who are caring at that front line, but on the human side of things, and they shouldn't necessarily be in, in conflict with each other, but on the human side of things, um, why are the rights of those people less than the rights of the shop owners? And these are, these are the questions that we ought to be having uh, and discussing as, as communities and societies. And it should be led by the politicians in my view, but uh, they're not being discussed as you say. And the I think Norman Swan has become ubiquitous, but I don't think that's a bad thing because one of the strengths, a bit like Dr. Carl, who in Australia is someone who communicates science to, to those of us who, who are semi-literate in that space. Uh, Norman Swan is a doctor who seeks to make accessible complex aspects of the coronavirus, of health issues generally, but the coronavirus particularly. Um, and, and more of these sorts of discussions around the hard issues that you've identified, Jürgen, and that we try and tease out a little bit in the publication are really necessary. I think people are capable of these complex discussions and we should be able to elevate the, um, the, the debates we're having beyond the, you know, the shouty, shouty uh, uh, radio shock jock aspect and that's one of the things I have noticed reflecting back on the last 12 months in preparing for this evening back when we were doing the publication Trump was still prime uh, president in the United States there was the furor in the United Kingdom about the way in which Boris Johnson and his parliament were handling the the um, the virus and yet now if we look at the situation in in the world we find that those political um, the political black and white aspect of the debates has diminished. It's gone into, receded into the background. We still have this question around deferring perhaps unduly to the medical experts. But in the recent debates, just in the last week here in Australia, that have come up around this question of the airflow of in, in hotels, because this is how this, the instance that gave rise to the shutdown in Perth was an instance where um, there were questions about the airborne nature of the of the virus, the nature of using um, hotels and the particular airflows within hotels, and how this how appropriate this is or is not. And all of these questions are ones that all members of the society are capable of engaging in and discussing, and in fact were discussing. Um, and it it uh, on the one hand, I'm hopeful that actually the level of debate will increase. But equally, the, the, the subject matter of the debate is exactly as Jürgen's just identified, those really difficult questions like, if we open up this, then the risk is this, and the risk is also for the vulnerable in the community, those who are least placed to defend their interests, and in similar sorts of vein to the point, some of the points Stefan was making in his presentation. So it, it, um, I think we're actually moving into a space where we're really as a community and as a society having to engage with really, really difficult choices and questions. Maybe those times have come in the past, but I think at the minute we're, we're really looking at them. Thank you, Anna. If I can just uh, jump in, I think the Stefan's um, uh, case that you were, that you were uh, referring to, the BHP case with ageism and racism, really put the, the, the finger on it because it, uh, you know, the protection uh, or the attempt to protect a, 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 
arguably particularly vulnerable part of the population, namely remote Aboriginal communities where there is literally no medical infrastructure, right? There's not, you know, it's just, you know, there's hardly any medical infrastructure in Perth, right? In terms of pandemic, uh, taking care of pandemic, much less in remote areas. That, that same attempt to protect um, arguably vulnerable uh, groups of people will then can easily turn around into uh, an accusation of being, you know, ageist or, or or racist or whatever the case may be. And this balancing of different rights positions that we in Germany tend to treat judicially is in Australia much more dealt with politically. Um, and uh, and the link back to the political decision makers in that sense is much stronger. Whereas we tend to. Uh, in Germany, put this to the feet at the feet of the constitutional court and say, you go ahead and do it. Thank you very much. Tatiana. Yeah. Uh, thanks to all of you for your presentations. It was very interesting. Um, I totally agree with Anne um, regarding the debate. I think that's the main issue, especially also in, in Germany. Um, and it might be that the politicians actually debate all these questions with uh, science scientists and researchers and virologists and everything, but they don't communicate it to the public. And that's the problem. We're um, in lockdown since October, more or less. Um, before that, we had a half lockdown. Um, people are not not um, well. How can I phrase it? They're, they don't. They can't accept to just get a law without the explanation. What's the basis, the legal and the scientific basis for that law? So I thought I saw today the um, there are 111 requests to the Constitutional Court today um, against the Notbremse Gesetz, um, the law. Um, and I, I do understand that because I feel, um, I think the, the politicians lost me in January with kind of weird laws that say you as one person can go to a couple's house, but a couple can't come to your house when you're single. And then all these weird regulations, um, there is no, or in my opinion, there is no basis for it. And if there is, they did not communicate it. The problem is with the health, health issue. Um, my, my sister is a nurse. I very, very much feel for all the front workers. Um, but I also know two people um, over the past year who have the pre-burnout syndrome. Um, I know two children who were born a year ago who have hardly any social connection. And that's the problem. It's not about social distancing. It's about physical distancing. The wording is already wrong. Um, and, and I know... Uh, people who became depressed over the past year. I feel it myself. I'm in home office since months, have hardly any contacts. I know a lot of people who do not work out anymore. And um, I think overweight will be a problem long-term and probably also violence um, is a problem. So that also affects the health system. And um, so my hope was very much in November for all the vaccinations and a quick program. Um, I, have, I got my first shot as well. Um, but obviously uh, now you have to wait till June to get the second and who knows what happens then. Um, so the, I think the problem really is the, um, the communication and also the very slow uh, vaccination rollout in Germany. Everyone hope for, for better. Yeah, thank you very much for this statement. Um, I, I'm quite sure that many people share this view. <laughs> um, if I, if I'm questions. Not what Tatjana was saying, I think uh, another problem, uh, at least in Germany, is that we don't have any exemptions for people who are fully uh, vaccinated. I think that's uh, one of the key issues raised in the constitutional complaints. And uh, for me, it's, it's absolutely not uh, understandable because uh, um, it's clear to everyone that those are not privileges, those, those are our constitutional rights. And if somebody is uh, vaccinated two times, and I think in Germany it's about 10% which are already at that stage, uh, there's no possibility to keep them locked up. Um, and I can't understand why um, the legislator is just closing its eyes, even if the, uh, I don't know the English term, the, the Wissenschaftliche Dienst des Bundestages in his, um, in his statement uh, says exactly that, that you cannot uh, lock up people who are fully vaccinated. And the Robert Koch Institute also uh, showed, I think last week that there isn't any danger from those people because they are not infectious at all. 
Um, and from the beginning of the pandemic, everyone is telling us um, we talk about this later, but uh, now it's the time to talk about this. And um, it's not a matter of how many people are, vac are vaccinated, uh, even if it's just one who's fully vaccinated, then there's no uh, uh, possibility to keep him locked up, in my view. Well, I think it's actually the view is actually uncontroversial. Uh, what was controversial was, and what is really new, is the knowledge over whether the vaccinated people are infectious or not. And since uh, uh, vaccination programs have only just started really, what, five, six, seven, eight weeks ago, uh, the data situation was very weak. But the minute it becomes scientifically clear that vaccinated people are not infectious, that's the minute when the restrictions for them will have to go. I totally agree. Yes, and uh, in Germany, the Robert Koch Institute uh, says exactly that. I think it was last week or two weeks before, but even now, um, um, they are not willing uh, to act accordingly. And that's the question of proportionability, right? Verhältnismäßigkeit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What? It's actually not a question of proportionality. It is a question of uh, the, the, the infringement of the right as such, there's actually no need, right? So it doesn't even get to proportionality because proportionality comes after you have a reason to infringe a right. If, if there is no such reason, then you don't even get to proportionality, then the, the whole thing would have to go. I think that legally that's actually not questionable. Right? It, what will be questioned is the factual side of the certainty, the determination of the certainty of the non-infectiousness of the vaccinated people, uh, because it's very, very new. Um, and, um, and so there will be a time lag. I don't know, you know how much time lag is, is justifiable there, but there will be a time lag. And it's going to be interesting to see how that is going to be picked up and what the, the data situation suggests. And the difficulty with this, of course, as well, is that the decision falls to, the po to politicians individually and collectively. And on the one hand, perhaps understandably, they don't want to take what at the minute is a rel reasonably courageous approach because while the information is starting to come through from the Robert Koch Institute and elsewhere, it's still not sufficient, I suggest, for them to be completely comfortable in making such a decision. And equally, the populations are really quite uh, unforgiving when there are decisions which turn out to be ones that, you know, have, have gone awry. Um, so it's a, we, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult and very vexed question. Um, and it's an interesting contrast, Jürgen, that you drew out between the, the political approach in the Australian context and the more legal approach in, in the German context. Um, and, I, I, I can't see a way reasonably forward other than just people discussing it and and looking for ways to to at least exercise more tolerance uh, individually and collectively. And one of the real one of the real uh, stark contrasts is the population density pretty much everywhere else in the world. But the population density here in Australia, relatively speaking, is low. On the other hand, in the contributions from um, Beatrice and uh, uh, one of our other colleagues, possibly even um, the New Zealand colleague, in relation to the way in which COVID has been handled in the Pacific Islands, leaving aside Papua New Guinea, which is really in, in dire straits at the moment. But in Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu, the Pacific Islands, they don't have the the health structures and the wherewithal for the state to be doing a great deal. And so the communities are in effect managing each other. There's a much stronger collective approach where the communities are managing. And that's not just the communities looking after the individuals in question who perhaps have, might have to be in isolation. So the community is, is managing the quarantine, whereas here we're doing it through the hotel system. But equally, the individuals are recognising that they can have you know, really dire consequences if they bring anything back to their families and their communities. So they're isolating. And the contrast then also with the Papua New Guinea situation, because their social, exactly what Tatiana was saying, the social connection and the community sense they're physically has the consequence that the COVID virus has spread so in such a rampant fashion. 
So there are interesting lessons to learn from these communities, but equally, once we get that level of, of, uh, of, of density and, and proximity, it becomes nigh on impossible to, to deal with it in a, in a clean or a clinical way. We're left with this, this mess that we're, we're just managing, you know, struggling through with all the, the, the consequences that, that uh, particularly Tatiana, the ones that you were, you were observing there, with people coming into this COVID, the children and and community uh, individual groups and and young people as well, it's going to have long lasting ramifications. Thank you very much. Looking to um, the clock, um, one last question. I have I have one, yeah. one 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 point that I would like to make. I mean, I um, I in principle agree with Dennis that you know people who are vaccinated should be allowed free. <laughs> <laughs> to, but but I I wonder what would happen in the current circumstances. It would be really introduced to, you know, the system in which uh, priorities where priorities vaccination are given. Because I, I I don't I don't know. I mean I know that in Germany the situation is not ideal. We are with our rollout uh, shambles. Um, so who's getting who's getting the vaccine, and is then allowed to go out of lockdown? Um, I I have a feeling that the reluctance to actually approach this point may have something to do with the problem that the rollout has not achieved the speed that it was supposed to achieve, and uh, and that could cause cause problem. I don't want to be locked in because. Uh, our government did not buy enough vaccine, you know, or did not think about how to produce it or whatever the, the point is. Yeah. Yeah. Just on that quickly, um, I take the view that if in a year's time everyone's had the opportunity of being vaccinated, I'm okay with the idea that you say, okay, there are certain things that people who've been vaccinated can do. Um, and it's been interesting actually reading this stuff here from, I'm in, I'm in Berlin, like Tatiana, um, it's been interesting reading the papers, how in some ways it's framed as a question of giving privileges to those who are vaccinated. And sometimes it's framed as giving people their basic rights back. And it's almost like, do I give you a basic right back or am I giving you a privilege? But be that as it may, one way or the other, um, I don't mind the idea from a sort of equity fairness point of view that in a year when we've all had the opportunity to do something, to get vaccinated, that we can all have our freedoms. Um, at the moment, though, I feel a little bit upset if, um, I mean, I'm just over this. I'm so, like, I can't be bothered going shopping. I, I go to the supermarket, that's it. But this whole hoo-ha about you need a test and an appointment and then you might be able to buy a pair of jeans or something like that. Stuff it, I don't care. Um, and I'm, I feel like at the moment <laughs> the response of the government here in Germany has been a little bit like the, I think they call it politician's fallacy. And there's a nice episode of Yes Minister where they explain it along the lines of, something must be done this is something therefore we must do this and i feel like some <laughs> of the ideas here like that easter shutdown that they were going to do and then three days later they said oh actually no we're not going to do it and then the britain the i think it was whoever came up the uh, horse Seehofer, Seehofer had the idea of the the bridge lockdown as so i think the poor politicians have no idea what to do but they feel they've got to do something and so we have these ridiculous, like Tatiana mentioned, rules of I'm allowed to go and visit a couple or a family of four, but the family of four can't visit me. Um, but at the same time, because they're running demonstrations in Stuttgart where there's thousands of people with no masks, no social distancing. And my personal view is, look, no one keeps the rules anyway, or very few people bother. Um, <clears throat> either let's do this properly, let's have a proper lockdown, or leave it. But this current kind of let's have ever harsher rules, which no one bothers to really check into, um, doesn't really get us anywhere. Well, that seems to be a perfect uh, final word here for the conference. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's Something must be done. You say in a year's time, that's interesting from a doctrinal perspective. You say in a year's time when everybody's had the chance to get vaccinated. But at that point, it's it's not a problem. Doctrinally, it is now a problem because now you could arguably say 
um, whether I've had the chance to get a shot or not, if you've had them and on the assumption that you're not infectious, of course, let's just assume that for a moment, on that assumption, it is hard on an equality basis uh, to say you have to continue to be unfree because others are unfree. That is not really a, um, a Grundrechtsposition that is easily tenable under the German system, at least. But you are quite right. That is one of the drivers. Well, my, uh, Michael, I think, uh, mm. put this up. This is, of course, the main driver now. Now, once everybody's had a chance, and once it is your free decision to say, I don't want to be vaccinated for whatever reason. At that point, it's easy, right? At that point, it goes home with you. And and but as long, you know, for for the time being, when a majority of people do not have the chance to be vaccinated, let's call it COVID point. solidarity. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> One very, very good. Thank you very, very much, all of you. Yeah, thank you. Um, a very interesting, a very <laughs> personal. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody, interesting topic. We experience it. Um, the, the, the burdens um, COVID-19 presses on us every day. Um, me sitting in my small office. <laughs> and um, I'm so hopeful that I'm about to leave this uh, very place um, sooner or later. Please, sooner. And I'm Probably looking later. <laughs> <laughs> I thank everybody of you for for your precious and interesting uh, input to to this uh, this conference, and I'm very much looking forward to meet you all in person latest for the next conference. I'm optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> you are, <laughs> which, which which may take place, and I'm quite um, optimistic in in October. So thank mm. you. Very much, all of you, stay healthy. Thank you, Frank. And I'm very much looking to see you. Bye. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Juliana.